This talk is sponsored by the Center for Natural Living. Well, it's good to be here tonight because I'm going to talk to you about one of my most favorite topics, and that is the path to universal abundance. You know, we all think it's possible, and the politicians always promise us that every election, and they never deliver. And the reason they don't deliver is because the creation of wealth and the path to universal abundance belongs in the realm of entrepreneurship. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about tonight. Now, to do that, I first have to talk a little bit about what wealth is. You know, back in what we call the olden days, people died at a very early age, mostly because they didn't have the advantage of fresh foods trucked in and refrigerated trucks. They did not have antibiotics. They did not have the type of sanitation that we have today. So today, we live a lot longer. This is our present wealth. And it was made possible, this increase in lifespan, by these creative uses of old resources to create antibiotics, refrigerant trucks, and, and other sources of health, such as supplements. I forgot to mention that. And in the past, of course, uh, people had a very limited view of the world. Uh, today, the whole world is our oyster. And in the future, the universe will be our oyster, so to speak. Now, again, all these changes are brought about by simply understanding that wealth is not money. It's the goods and services that we can create that our money buys. If we were on a desert island, we could have all the money in the world. But if we had no food, water, or medicine, we would not consider ourselves wealthy, especially if we couldn't buy it. So let's talk about what's happened to the world in the past and the future. Here we have the gross national product per capita. Basically, it means the amount of wealth creation per person. I mean, it's a measure of wealth creation, an imperfect one, I, I agree, but the best we've got. And here we've got the different years. And back, you know, in the 1700s, everybody, and all back here in the years I haven't shown, everybody was pretty much living on $1,000 a year, what the equivalent wealth would be for $1,000 a year. That's not very much. And that happened for centuries until one day, what happened? Well, at the late 1700s, early 1800s, all of a sudden, in what we now call the developed world, we got an increase in wealth creation, a very big increase. But in what we call the third world, there wasn't much change. Why did that happen? Well, it happened because in the late 1700s, early 1800s, we had an unusual situation called the United States of America, in which economic freedom became a reality. Now, prior to that, if you wanted to be an entrepreneur, well, actually, it was very difficult because you had to go to the king or the monarch, and you had to get permission to engage in that particular activity. And if you were one of the lucky ones, you got a monopoly. And if you weren't one of the lucky ones, he just said no. And the guilds, if you wanted to be in a particular profession, if you did not have the money and clout to get into a guild, well, you couldn't be a carpenter. You know, you couldn't shoe horses. You couldn't do whatever it was you wanted to do without permission of the guilds. Well, that didn't happen in the US. So all of a sudden, entrepreneurs were able to do what they do best, which is create wealth, new ideas, putting old resources to new uses. So that's what happened. Now, to give you an example of how this works in real life, uh, John Stossel, when he was with ABC News, he's now with Fox Business News, he went and he decided he was going to open a business selling Frisbees. So he went to Hong Kong, which had been raided uh, shortly before he did this, as the most economically free area in the world. And he was able to open his business in hours. In New York City, it took weeks. In India, it took years with no promise that he would ever be able to open his Frisbee store. Now, what this means is that there were so many regulations and hurdles that he was not able to get his business going in India. And this is why India is poor relative to the United States. And the United States is getting a little less wealthy compared to Hong Kong. Their per capita income at the time of this study was actually 
quite high and, and a little bit higher than the US. So if regulation is driving people out of business, how does this work? You know, let's see some more evidence. So if you look at what happened between 1980 and the early 90s in the US, and you look at regulators in the thousands, you see that in the Reagan years, the number of regulators actually decreased considerably, about 20%. And while that was going on, the number of private sector jobs increased. And this increase was in the millions as opposed to thousands for the federal regulators. And of course, the situation then reversed itself years later. What this shows is that regulators, on average, destroy 150 private sector jobs. And which jobs are they destroying? The entrepreneurial jobs, the small businesses. Why is this bad? Small businesses create about 80% of the jobs. So if we destroy small businesses and entrepreneurs, we are really destroying the wealth-creating engine of our country, which of course is jobs. That's how we create wealth. We have some type of job, even if it's working for another company or working for ourselves. And working for ourselves and having a small firm is the way that most wealth is created in this and other countries. Now, a lot of people are concerned about this because they said initially when they saw the developing countries finally developing, oh, this is going to be bad because we will have the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor. But actually, just the opposite happened. If you look here, this is the amount of GN, uh, GDP per capita again. So it's, and it's graphed against the economic freedom index in which, which includes a big component of how kind the government is to entrepreneurs. So in other words, if you have high freedom, you don't have much regulation. And as you can see, as wealth creation increases, and it does as freedom increases, the number of people living in poverty goes down in direct proportion. So the poor don't get poorer, and the rich don't get richer when we have wealth creation. In fact, just the opposite occurs. Why is that? Well, if you think about it for a moment, who has the most chance of jumping over those regulatory hoops? Is it the poor, the disadvantaged? No, of course not. <laughs> the people who have the best chance of jumping through the regulatory hoops are people who already have. And in this slide, what I'm showing you is that there's good news. The good news is that this is being recognized. And here we see clients of the Institute for Justice. This is an organization that is quite interesting and actually now has a branch in Austin. And what they do is they seek out people who are being put out of business by regulators and taking on their case pro bono. And they are doing a great job. Um, I don't have any association with them other than being a donor, but I'd like to plug them a little bit. They've been to the Supreme Court a couple times now. They are doing a fantastic job. And look at who their clients are, who tried to start a taxi cab service or a limo service, but the regulations said that before they could do that, the people who were already in business got to weigh in and, and tell the regulators whether or not this new service was needed. What do you think they told them? <laughs> It's just like the regulations we heard about with the beer earlier. The big beer companies limiting the little beer companies through regulations. And this is what's happening. Now, of course, one of the reasons we have regulations is we believe that it will protect the consumer. But in fact, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, that does not seem to be the case either. Here in the United States, for example, we have laws regulating the training that an electrician must get before they can get that license. So every state is different. Now, if it protected the consumer to have these regulations, we would expect there to be fewer accidental electrocutions in states with the most rigorous licensing laws. In fact, we see just the opposite. Why? Because if we, have, if we have a regulation that says you have to go to school for so many years, apprentice for so many years, and it will cost so much money, the more the higher those regulations are, the fewer people can afford to become electricians. That means 
that there won't be many electricians and with supply and demand, it means they can command higher prices. So that when the poor person has a problem with their electricity, what do they do? They can't afford the electrician, they don't call the electrician, or they try the repair themselves and end up being electrocuted. So oftentimes, these regulations are so excessive that they actually kill the very people that they're purported to protect. Now, more good news. What happens when a country decides that they are going to stop government spending, which really means they're going to have fewer regulators because most government officials are regulators of some type, and they are going to um, have fewer restrictions on entrepreneurship. Well, what happens is, again, if you look at the wealth creation in those countries, you actually see that when they go from high spending to low spending, that they increase their wealth creation. And these three countries that I'm showing you are Ireland, New Zealand, and United Kingdom. And um, Ireland was from eight, uh, 1987 to 96. Uh, New Zealand, 1993 to 96, and the United Kingdom, 83 to 89. So these are real life examples of actually how easy and how quickly wealth creation can almost double, as you see here, with very little um, centralized regulation. In fact, it is deregulation that helps. And the reason it does is because it allows entrepreneurs to do what they do best, create wealth. They are the ones with the new ideas. They are the ones that take old resources and use them in new ways to create new wealth. And if you're a poor person, wouldn't you rather live in a wealthy country than a poor one? Wouldn't you rather be in the United States than in India? It's pretty clear that when the country is wealthy that everyone is better off. So the message I want to leave with you tonight is that poverty can be eliminated. It is universal abundance is well within our grasp. We know the mechanics of how it works. This isn't a guess anymore. It's, it's very clear. And entrepreneurship is the means by which this happens. So obviously, if we want to have universal abundance, and I think that that is something that humankind has longed for. For, for eons, that if we want to have that, we have to let the entrepreneurs do what they do best, create wealth, and get rid of the regulations that are stopping them from doing that. And then, almost automatically, in the emergent order that we saw in the last talk, wealth grows and everyone benefits. Now, because my time is limited tonight, I can't share with you much more in the way of detail um, than I already have. So if you want to know more, I invite you to go to my website, where there's a lot of free material, including um, a free download of my book, Healing Our World, the 1992 version. And if you uh, have questions or concerns or want to know more about this, I encourage you to email me. So I want to thank you for your attention tonight, and I want to again leave you with a message that the universal abundance that we have always wanted for the entire world is ours if we just let the entrepreneurs create it. Thank you.